So with the football season nearly starting up again and me being late to trends, I thought I'd explain and go over an iceberg I discovered. The original iceberg was made by... Um... Um... Wait, how would you even say that? Yeah, 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 I'll go, I'll go with that. And this one that I found was purely a World Cup one, so I added a few Euros topics in there as well. Yeah, if only I made this video before the Euros ended, I would have had a chance to get more than 10 views, but you know, oh well. If you haven't seen one of those videos before, or you don't know what an iceberg chart is, it's where there is a certain large topic, this one being international football tournaments, and there are events and conspiracies about the topic on the chart, and the further you go down, the more obscure they are. So without further ado, let's get straight into the video. It's coming home. So if you live in England, or probably across the world, you've probably heard this song. It's from the 1996 Euros, which coincidentally was probably the last time England looked like it was winning anything. Apart from this Euros this year, where England lost in the final, but it doesn't matter, it's coming home 2022! It's sung by England fans across the nation, in stadiums, pubs, and in the street at 3am. The people outside England think we are a very arrogant country when it comes to football. And, and they're right, but <laughs> I think this song is sung in a very ironic way. What other massive footballing country would cheer and basically say they're going to win the tournament after winning against a third world country? Fucking England would. 7-1. This refers to the 2014 World Cup match, Brazil vs Germany, where Germany absolutely demolished the host nation. And I don't care what you say, see, me seeing those Brazilian fans cry, it was quite crazy. And looking back at this match, in hindsight, two of the best players from the Brazil team were missing. There was the captain Thiago Silva, who accumulated too many yellow cards and was suspended for the match, leaving David Luiz as their captain, David Luiz, and Neymar missed out due to a serious injury the match prior. The Panini sticker album. If you haven't heard of these, they're like trading cards or stickers that players have of them for the World Cup of Euros, a bit like match attacks from back in the day. I don't really know why this is on the iceberg. The only mildly interesting thing I found out about it is that a fully completed 1970 World Cup sticker album signed by Pelé sold for over 10 grand in 2017. Wow, so interesting. FIFA Gate. So in 2015, the FBI accused FIFA of corruption. FIFA being the governing body of football and, of course, the people that organised the World Cup. They were accused of wire fraud, racketeering, money laundering, naughty, naughty boys, naughty boys. Everybody that was investigated pleaded guilty. Basically, FIFA doing FIFA things and the US arrested a few people. Luis Suarez handball. This refers to the 2010 World Cup quarter-final match, Uruguay vs Ghana. The match was in the 120th minute. Garner put a cross in from a free kick and was hit goalwards. Suarez stopped the goal bound shot, which was rebounded back to the Ghanaian. Ghanaian? Ghanaian? Is that how you say it? Uh, anyway, he shot again. Suarez this time saved it with his hand, of course, and cleared it off the line. He got sent off, but when the subsequent penalty missed, he celebrated on the sidelines. You guy went on to win the game on pens and send Garner out. What an absolute mad lad. Pele. He's just like Pele in it. <laughs> I know he's like one of the best footballers about and has won multiple World Cup records like being the youngest player ever to score a hat-trick in the final. While doing some research for this, um, I found the age of the youngest player to ever play in a qualifying match. His name was... Like, I'm, I'm not saying that. He played a match for Togo when he was 13. <laughs> What the fuck? Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Pele isn't amazing. He's still a fraud in my books. He says he scored a thousand goals, but on Wikipedia, he scored only 615. And everybody knows Wikipedia is an absolutely trusted source where nobody can tamper with at all. But I guess he's the right player, I guess. The Jabalani. For every major tournament of football, a different ball is made. For the 2010 World Cup in South Africa, the Jabalani ball was created. This ball was absolutely mental, it swerved everywhere, and it was just a pain for all keepers. Crying German girl. So, England versus Germany, 2020 Euros. Actually in 2021, England won 2-0. Come on! English people made fun of a German girl crying. Uh, I thought nothing wrong with it, a bit of Mickey taking, but some people went a bit too far and said stuff to the, to the girl and the family that were absolutely disgusting. Anyway, all this happens and somebody starts a fundraiser earning over £35,000 for the family. Um, what the fuck? Marco Anatovic racist? I don't know why I laughed though, that was, that, that was really... Uh, so it's the 2020 Euros, Austria are playing North Macedonia, Marco Anatovic comes on in a sub and scores the final goal in the match to make it 3-1. 
As his celebration, he started ranting aggressively. In his rants, the reports have said that he said, I am fucking your Albanian mother, <laughs> uh, among other stuff. There's lots of political tension between Albania and North Macedonia, and what he said in his rant was deemed racist, and he was given a one-match ban by UEFA. Some say this video was shown to the team before the match against Ukraine, and that's why they scored four goals. Zidane headbutt. 2006 World Cup final, France versus Italy. It was Zidane's last game as a professional footballer after he said he would retire after this tournament was over. Zidane put France ahead with a Penenka penalty. What a saucy boy. Italy would go on and score another and take the game to extra time. When the 110th minute, Zidane headbutted Marco, uh, Marco Materazzi. I hope I'm saying that right. And so Dan was subsequently red carded and sent off and Italy won the game on planes, blah, blah, blah. But what's actually said to Zidane? Apparently they were having confrontations during the game, shit talking and all that. I'll come out of my house and I'll break your fucking legs, you little prick. And so Dan's shirt was being pulled by Marazzi at the time. And he said, I'll give you my shirt later. Materazzi said, I'd rather have your sister's shirt. Marco was brushing up on his Modern Warfare 2 shit talking skills before the match. Bebetol's celebration. It's actually quite a wholesome moment. Uh, Bebetol was a Brazilian forward who played in the 1994 World Cup and he generated headlines after he scored uh, and his goal celebration was rocking an imaginary baby after scoring against the Netherlands. His wife had given birth to their third child three days before. Tiki Taka. Uh, so Tiki Taka is a footballing term used to describe how Spanish teams predominantly played football from 2008 to about 2012-2014. It took massive influence of Johan Cruyff's total football play and would consist of basically passing the opposition off of the pitch and maintaining huge amounts of possession. <laughs> The first remnants of this would be in the Spain qualifiers in 2008 Euros and we all know what happened from that point. For people who don't know, they would win two Euros in a row with a World Cup in the middle just for good measure. Same with, uh, Spain would also lead, some of, oh, fuck. Spain would also famously run no strikers. Um, Spain would also at points run zero strikers and that's what they also... Fucking hell. Spain would also famously run, famously run, oh my god. Spain would also famously run no point. Oh. I can't read. I actually can't read. Spain would also famously run no strikers at points, like the 2010 World Cup final. Why was why was that so fucking hard to say? However, success after the twin. However, 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 success after the 2012 Euros died down dramatically when teams started to catch on. An example of this would be that Netherlands team that they lost to in the 2010 World Cup final where they absolutely destroyed the Spanish team in the 2014 group stages, winning 5-1 with one of the most insane goals by Roman Van Persie. Hand of God. I think this is quite an infamous one, but for you six-year-olds, here's what happened. Uh, it's the 1986 World Cup, Argentina versus England quarterfinals. The ball was hit up in the air by an English player into their own box. Absolute twat. Uh, but it looked like it was a routine punch, bearing in mind Maradona isn't the tallest bloke in the world. But used his hand to knock the ball over the keeper, and the goal was given to make the game 1-0. The game finished 2-1, which the other goal he scored might have been one of the best goals of the century. But of course it was overshadowed by the hand of God. And of course, the cheating bastard won the tournament as well. Denmark win the Euros. So someone like Denmark, already being a dark horse, would be a massive surprise to everyone if they won the Euros. But what if I told you... They didn't even qualify for the tournament. So basically, Yugoslavia qualified, which is nowadays a combination of Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Macedonia and Montenegro. By the way, that team's an absolute cheat code. Anyway, some politics happens, blah, blah, blah. They decided to split up and they were disqualified as a result of this. Denmark were brought into the 1992 Euros being runners up of their qualifying group and went on to of course win it all beating Germany 2-0 in the final. Vuvuzela. So a Vuvuzela is basically a cheap long plastic horn commonly used 
in the crowd at South African matches. And they are very fucking loud. They were used in basically every single match in the 2010 World Cup due to it being held in South Africa, of course. They became very iconic and a staple of basically the 2010 World Cup matches. They tried to make a comeback after 2010, but they were banned from all stadiums due to health concerns. However, they're still used in some South African football matches today. So if you're down there and want to see a football match for some reason, bring some earplugs. Ronaldo and Nike, 1998. Just to make it clear, we're talking about Brazilian Ronaldo here, aka Big Bunda Ronaldo, rather than Cristiano. Just a side note, I had to search up Fat Ronaldo ass on my computer. I'm definitely on some sort of list now. So it was the 1998 World Cup final, Ronaldo's name was not on the team sheet. There was wide speculation why one of the best footballers at the time wasn't playing, then all of a sudden he was on there. However, he underperformed in the match and France beat Brazil 3-0. Now let's go back to before the match and see what actually happened. Ronaldo, after he had his lunch, had a severe fit which would surely keep him out of the team, but he still played. There's lots of speculation why he still played after suffering a fit, but one of the main ones is that Nike forced him to play due to his contract of over 100 million euros with them. This contract presumably obligated him to play every match for Brazil. England disallowed goal 2010. Time for me to get salty again. So it's the 2010 World Cup final. No. World Cup final? Like we're making it to the World Cup final. So it's the 2010 World Cup round of 16. Germany were leading 2-0 against England. We were definitely going to lose, but you know. No, no, sh 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 uh, Frank Lampard hit an absolute screamer from outside the box, hitting the underside of the bar, and clearly crossing the line before it came out back at the goal. But it was never given. Germany went on to win the match 4-1 and knock England out. But the incident made uh, technology more accepted in football and goal line technology was later implemented in the next World Cup. Jules Rimmett trophy story. So the Jules Rimmett trophy, hopefully I'm saying that right, I'm, I'm probably butchering so many names during this video. Anyway, it's a famous trophy given to the team that wins the World Cup. Prior to 1966, the trophy was stolen from an exhibition in England. Seven days after the robbery, it was found by a dog named Pickles. No, I'm not making this up. So apparently he sniffed some package and the trophy was wrapped in newspaper um, and the owner found it. Only one person was caught for being involved in the robbery, however no one else was found. Later on the trophy was given to Brazil after winning three World Cups and another trophy was commissioned for the next World Cup, which is the trophy we have now. Um, the trophy that was given to Brazil though was uh, <laughs> later stolen again. Um, it was thought to have been melted down into gold bars. Total Football. Like I said earlier, Total Football is known to be the predecessor to Tiki Taka Play, famously used by the Dutch team in the 1970s, where any outfield player can take the role of any other position in the team. This was impossible to defend. Johan Cruyff mastered this way of playing. This style influenced and innovated football and changed it forever. Just a shame they didn't win a World Cup, eh? Gordon Banks won the save. Known as one of the best saves ever, Gordon Banks denied a sure goal for Pele in the 1970 World Cup. This is also where we got the iconic commentary line. What a save! Gordon Banks! Greece win the Euros 2004. Ugh, right, so this is a big one. Before the 2004 Euros, Greece had only qualified for two major tournaments, not winning a single game in either. So off the bat, their chances of even qualifying were slim. To add on to this, their team didn't boast any household names at all, and there wasn't really a massive pool of players to choose from, so people at the time ruled them out very quickly. But they surprised in qualifying, finishing above a formidable Spanish side, and finishing first. However, as you can see, their goal difference was much lower than the aforementioned Spanish side, scoring only 8 goals in 6 games and only having a goal difference of plus 4. This would foreshadow their approach and style of play in the actual Euros tournament. They were placed in an extremely tough group with Spain, Russia and the hosts Portugal which they would play in the opening match of the tournament and would already shock the world with a 2-1 win. They would follow that by drawing against Spain and funnily enough lose against the weakest of the bunch, Russia. Luckily Greece has stuck their way into the quarterfinals with Spain losing to Portugal and Greece finishing second. However, all hope was surely lost after they saw who they were playing in the next round. France. The current holders at the time. With Zidane. Basically, their team was absolutely stacked. But of course, 
Greece being Greece, they scraped a 1-0 win. The perception of the team was quite negative. They played a defensive style of play, a bit like Burnley nowadays, but except less Brexit and... Uh, I, I don't know, what, what, what are Greece known for? Um, the economic crisis? But anyway, they got to the semi-finals and they would play the Czech Republic in an extremely tight affair. Uh, the match went into extra time and now I'm going to do a little segue into why UEFA are really fucking stupid. So most of you guys have probably heard of the golden goal rule. It's where extra time is played out and the first team to score wins the match. This is only used a few times due to teams sitting back because they were too scared to concede. However, UEFA being really, really smart, being really, really smart and not wanting to change back to the classic not fucking broken extra time, uh, chose to implement a silver goal rule. A silver goal rule. I am not kidding you. It's supposed to be a more forgiving version of the golden goal rule. If a team scores in the first half of extra time, the other team, they have until the end of the half to score. And if they don't, then the team that scored wins. What they didn't think about is that some team, like Greece, could wait until the end of the first half and score literally in the last second of the game in injury time to put them through to the final. And of course, that, that's what they did. I'm pretty sure the silver goal rule was never used again in any major tournament. But alas, Greece made it through to the final. And you know the rest. They scored, of course, another header for corner and hung on for a 1-0 lead against Portugal and won the Euros. Argentina versus Peru, 1978. No beating around the bush here. Argentina won 6-0. But there were still some unsolved conspiracies about the match. Apparently, the Peru... The Peruvian? Yeah, the Peruvian goalkeeper. So apparently the Peruvian goalkeeper had Argentina to send, and reports say the, the Peru players threw the match to let the Argentinians win, probably for match fixing purposes. But there isn't much more info on this, so let's move on to the next one. Euros hosts don't qualify. We've already talked about a team that won the Euros without qualifying. What about a host nation that didn't qualify? If you didn't know, if you're the host nation, you normally get automatic qualification for the Euros or World Cup or whatever tournament you're in. Um, now, for the most recent 2020 Euros, there were multiple host nations due to it being the 50th anniversary of the Euros. Well, it would have been the 50th anniversary if it wasn't for good old Corona delaying it for a year. Uh, there was 12 host nations, with two of them, Romania and Azerbaijan, not qualifying. Okay, I know this one's a bit of a cop-out, but, you know, it's it's true. Technically, it's true. Uh, 2002, South Korea match-fixing. So the 2002 World Cup rolls about and sees South Korea and Japan combined hosts and therefore automatically qualify for the tournament. South Korea have never progressed out of the group stages and hadn't even won a match. But of course we've had underdog stories before like Denmark and Greece winning the Euros but this one was a bit different. They went all the way to the semi-finals but not without massive controversy. South Korea used a very aggressive play style with hard and reckless challenges coming left, right and centre and refs hardly batted an eyelid. While on the other side, blatant dives were given as fouls by the opposition and even in the game uh, versus Spain, a blatant goal was disallowed for what seems like absolutely nothing. Basically, EA scripting in real life. The officials were widely criticised but no charges were given to any of the officials and South Korea has not been stripped of their fourth place finish. Actually, let's go back on that point. So there was an official named Byron Moreno who was there. He got charged a year later in Ecuador for match fixing and also, what it says on the Wikipedia page, was found out to be a drug mule trying to smuggling 6 kilograms of heroin into America. <laughs> what? <laughs> El Quinto Partido, Partido, Pat, Pat, Fuck. Also known as the Fifth Game Curse, it dates back to 1994. It relates to how the Mexico national team can't reach the fifth game or the quarterfinals of the World Cup while reaching the round of 16 multiple times. Wait, <laughs> what? So I want to check any how many times they um, reached the round of 16. Since 1994, they have reached it every single time they reached the round of 16 every single time and not progressed into the quarterfinals what the fuck roger miller okay i'm not gonna lie before researching this i've never heard of this guy now, but now i've researched him he's an absolute g so he's a cameroonian striker who had a decent international career but, but he retired in 1988 
at the age of 36. Two years later, the president of Cameroon uh, gave him a phone call, just li- like you do, uh, begging him to come out of retirement and play for the national team in the 1990 World Cup in Italy. At the age of 38, he bagged four goals, two of them being against Colombia in the round of 16, and sent them through to the quarterfinals. This was the furthest any African team had got in the competition at the time. In the quarterfinals, he came on as a super sub against England and put on an amazing performance, winning a penalty and assisting the second goal. Sadly, the dream stopped there and the match ended 3-2 to England, or so they thought. No, not, not the match. The match the match was 3-2. I mean, I mean Miller's career. Four years later, at the age of 42, Miller returned back to the World Cup, being the oldest player at the time to ever play in one. He also bagged a goal against Russia, making him the oldest player to ever score at a World Cup Finals. And that still stands to this day. Maradona doping. Well, we all know Maradona, how good of a player he is, and his long experience with drugs. Basically every time I see highlights of this guy, he looks like he snorted a fat line just before walking on the pitch. With the 1994 World Cup, his last tournament before he retired from international football, he played the first two matches. In the first game, he scored a remarkable goal against Greece, his celebration, let's just say, was manic. Straight after the second match against Nigeria, he was escorted off the pitch and subsequently got kicked out of the competition after he failed two drugs tests. Russia doping. From one person taking drugs to nearly a whole nation. Okay, that came out a bit offensive there. I, d- I didn't mean that. <laughs> uh, now, this isn't just a footballing matter. It's basically the whole sporting aspect in Russia has been a disarray for the past few years. In 2015, the World Anti-Doping Agency uh, came out and said that they had evidence of mass doping among Russian track and field athletes. An investigation went into all professional sporting matters in Russia and in the last five years, at least 643 positive cases of illegal sporting drugs have been used by Russian athletes. Implications that had on the Russian athletes competing in the 2021 Tokyo Olympics that are going on right now is that they have to be represented by a neutral flag and not have their national anthem played. This could be the same for the 2022 World Cup Russian team, but we still don't know yet. The Mighty Magyars, also known as the Golden Team or that Hungarian team from the 1950s with Puskas. Uh, They were a team between 1950 and 1956. They won 42 games, drew seven, and only lost one, which was a World Cup final against West Germany. They also are well renowned for absolutely whacking England 6-3 in a friendly in Wembley, and just before the group stages of the 1954 World Cup, whacking them 7-1. They lost in the final uh, of that World Cup against West Germany 3-2, and they had the highest ELO rating of any international team ever. Sadly, they never got to win a World Cup due to the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, which caused the breakup of the squad. So brings the end to the first part of the video. This took a long time to research and make, so if you did like it, let me know in the comments. Of course, there will be a part two and maybe a part three, depending on how lazy I am. However, that might be quite far away. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed the video and hope you guys have a good day and see you in the next one.